What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about metabolic alkalosis. Before we get started though, please continue to support us by subscribing, hitting that like button, and commenting down in the comment section. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's talk about the etiology and pathophysiology of metabolic alkalosis. So I like to, the easy way I like to remember them in my head is, is the person volume down? And if I give them some fluid, they're gonna to respond to that and improve, or are they, uh, kind of normal volume or volume up and if I give them fluid it's not really going to make a difference it's not going to help them at all so that's kind of the way I help it helps me to separate my etiologies so if the person is volume down they're losing some type of volume somewhere and the first one I like to think about are they vomiting if someone's vomiting you're losing a lot of volume and they'd be pretty responsive to a fluid bolus so why would vomiting first off, be a cause of metabolic alkalosis. It's actually relatively simple, right? When you vomit, what are you getting rid of from your GI tract? Protons, right? Because in your actual stomach, you have tons and tons of hydrochloric acid. And so you're spilling out tons of protons from the GI tract. As you spill out a lot of these protons, what happens then as a result to the pH within the, the, the body? Well, the pH will then start to increase. There's also some other mechanisms in here. You actually kind of reabsorb a little bit more bicarb as a response to this. I don't want to go crazy into detail, but you do actually reabsorb a little bit more bicarb um, in response to this getting rid of a lot of protons. But that's one way. If we increase the pH, that's causing an alkalosis and the problem is due to an underlying issue with a metabolic change. In this case, vomiting. So vomiting, consistent vomiting, profuse vomiting, exorcist-like level vomiting, right? That could be one poten potential cause, but also it could be a way that we're, we're doing it where we are actually vomiting for them. We're actually pulling that vomit off in situations where maybe they have a bowel obstruction or they have some issue like pancreatitis or they're not able to get that, hydro or that food chyme, all of that stuff, stomach contents moving forward and we have to suction that off. What's that called? suctioning via an NG tube. So we call that NG suction. So nasogastric tube suction. And this can happen in conditions generally where there's a lot of inflammation, right? Or an obstruction somewhere within the uh, upper part of the GI tract. Okay, so those are two easy causes to automatically think about. Are they vomiting? Or are you suctioning them a lot via their nasogastric tube? The next one that I like to think about is, okay, if they're not losing a lot of volume from their GI tract? Are they losing a lot of volume from their urinary system? So I go to the renal things. And generally, one of the most common causes that you see a lot of is that someone is on a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic. So if you have them on a diuretic, more commonly loops, but we'll say diuretic use. So you just gave them a diuretic, okay? What do diuretics do? They pull off tons of fluid, right? They're gonna get rid of sodium, they're gonna get rid of potassium, they're gonna pull with it water. But if you guys remember from our video on loop diuretics, their mechanism of action, one of the other issues is not only does it pull water, sodium, and potassium with it, what else does it pull with it? Protons. So guess what else you lose of a lot of in the urinary system, particularly in the urine? Protons. And then guess what else they do? They actually reabsorb a little bit more bicarb. So they excrete sodium, potassium, water, get rid of protons, and reabsorb a teensy bit of bicarb. What does that do then? If you're getting rid of protons, you're decreasing your proton concentration, you're increasing your bicarb, what's that gonna do to your pH? It's gonna sh uh, shoot that pH up, right? It's gonna cause that alkalosis. So diuretic use could be a very potential cause of this. More particularly, loops, less commonly, thiazide diuretics. The next one is kind of like a, a weird one, it's there for the sake of being thorough. And this is actually a very interesting one. So sometimes in people who have chronic respiratory acidoses, um, COPD is, is, is an example here. And people who have chronic respiratory acidosis, what is one of the things that they usually just kind of live with at, as their baseline? They have an acidosis. They retain a lot of CO2. So they don't get a lot of that CO2 out of the body because of their underlying <clears throat> obstructive disease. And again, this is most common in what kind of conditions? COPD ears. So they naturally get rid of very little CO2. And do you guys remember your equation? That CO2 plus water yields carbonic acid 
carbonic acid disassociates into protons and into bicarb. What happens if you actually don't get rid of a lot of CO2, and if I were to draw like a blood vessel because they're not getting rid of the CO2, what happens as a result of this in the blood? You build up a lot of CO2. So what happens in this reaction if we use Le Chatelier's principle? If you get a lot of CO2 in here, we'll just represent like this, lots of CO2. What happens? Well then if you increase this, it has to shift to the right. If you shift it to the right, what happens as a result of that? You make a lot of protons. Now you guys are like, whoa, Zach, I thought this was metabolic alkalosis. Believe me, it is, I'll explain what happens. They get a lot of protons. That's gonna do what? A lot of protons will decrease the pH. Now, as a response to that acidosis, what does the body do? It triggers the kidneys over time, right? It's a long-term kind of compensation. But eventually, your kidneys will kick in. They'll say, oh, pH is really low. I'm gonna start urinating out a lot of what? Protons. I'm gonna get rid of a lot of protons in the urine. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to reabsorb some bicarb. And by doing that, what happens as a result of this? You try to increase the pH to compensate for this chronic respiratory acidosis. Now here's where it gets interesting, and this is why this is a little weird kind of condition, but it's something to remember, especially if you work in an ICU. If someone has chronic respiratory acidosis, it's compensatory, they have that increase in bicarb now, you put them on a ventilator. You put them on a ventilator and treat their COPD. Once you put them on a ventilator, and let's say that you're breathing properly for them, that you get rid of some of that excess CO2 a little bit better now than they can on their own. So now they're on the ventilator and you remove their CO2. What happens? If there was a lot of CO2, you put them on a ventilator, you drop their CO2 levels a little bit, what's gonna happen now? The reaction will shift to the left. And now because of that, they may normalize or they may go in the opposite direction a little bit, but either way, the protons now in the blood are gonna start to decrease. If the protons in the blood start to decrease, now the pH will kind of go up. And let's just say that there's a resolution of their respiratory acidosis, but what's left over? What's left over? Lots of bicarb. So their kidneys compensated for them. They increased their bicarb. You put them on a ventilator, got rid of their respiratory acidosis. Now what do they have left over? They have a compensatory metabolic alkalosis that's left over. We call this a post-hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. That's the cause. So this is called post-hypercapnia metabolic alkalosis. And this is a unique case that you see in people with chronic COPD. You put them on a ventilator, get rid of their CO2, and then they still have this bicarb from their kidneys compensating. So very, very interesting situation here. Okay, so we've covered for the most part the saline responsive etiologies. Now what I wanna do is talk about some of the saline resistant etiologies. All right, so we have the saline responsive etiologies, right? Vomiting, NG tube suction, right? Current diuretic, or actually prior diuretic use, and then post hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. Saline resistant ones are less common. The saline responses are gonna be by far the more common etiologies that you guys really need to remember. But we'll still mention some of these. So saline resistant, the first one that's probably on the higher yield but not as common is when someone has a lot of a particular type of mineral corticoid. Do you know your adrenal cortex? It makes a very special mineral corticoid. You know what that's called? It's called aldosterone. So aldosterone is a steroid hormone, and what do we know about this hormone? Well, we know that this acts on the kidneys, right? Particularly around that distal convoluted tubule collecting duct area. And what's the overall response of it? The overall response is that you reabsorb sodium, okay, which pulls water with it. So that would be kind of the mechanism here is that you would pull sodium into the blood, you pull water into the blood, and that may kind of increase your blood volume, and as a response, increase your blood pressure, right? The other thing is you get rid of a couple things. You get rid of potassium. You get rid of bi uh, uh, protons. And so because of that, you're getting rid of some of these acid molecules. And the other thing is, there's a teensy bit, not a ton, but there's a teensy bit of bicarb reabsorption. So if you have a combined effect where you're getting rid of a lot of protons, that's gonna decrease the protons within the blood, what will that do to the pH? That'll increase your pH, right? you're increasing a little bit of your bicarb reabsorption, what's that gonna do? That's also gonna increase your pH.
okay? But this is more pronounced because this can be relatively normal whenever there's normal aldosterone levels. But what happens if I jack up my aldosterone levels? I jack that sucker up now and I got blasting aldosterone levels all over the place. Now what's gonna happen? I'm gonna reabsorb more sodium, more water, have higher blood volume, higher blood pressures. I'm gonna reabsorb a little bit more bicarb than usual. I'm gonna increase that pH and I'm just gonna start urinating out like a crazy man, tons of these protons, which is also going to increase my pH. That could be a potential etiology. Not super common, but still something to remember. So what would this be called here when you have tons of aldosterone? Well, here's where we gotta be a little bit careful, right? Because you can have what's called hyperaldosteronism. And this can be due to many different things. So the, the first thing to remember is, is it primary? So is it an issue with the adrenal cortex? And so if it is an, an issue with the adrenal cortex, we give that a particular name. It's called Kahn syndrome. And it's important to remember that this is a primary cause. It's an issue with the adrenal cortex. Most likely just a big old goombok or tumor here that's just blasting out aldosterone, okay? The second thing is you want to remember, is this a secondary cause? Is there something that's eventually leading to higher aldosterone levels? These ones are a teensy bit more common, but secondary issues would be something like renal artery stenosis, and I'll explain why. Um, the third one could be if someone has CHF, or maybe even cirrhosis. We'll kind of combine these two and explain the mechanism really, really briefly. So think about this very, very simply. Your kidneys, they depend upon a lot of, you know, decent amount of blood flow. They need blood flow in order for them to function, right? So what happens is what if somebody has an issue where they have renal artery stenosis or they just don't have a lot of blood flow coming to the kidney, right? And CHF, cirrhosis, something like that. If there's decreased blood flow, whether it be due to a blockage or just not enough blood, how do your kidneys usually respond to that decrease in blood flow? What's that hormone that they release? Renin. So the kidneys will then release a particular hormone here called renin. And what does renin do? We're not gonna go through this entire cascade, but you know that it eventually leads to angiotensin II production. What does angiotensin II do? Stimulates the adrenal cortex to make aldosterone. If I make more aldosterone than usual, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna produce the same effect over here, just secondarily. It's not the adrenal cortex that's the problem, it's a secondary issue that's causing the adrenal cortex to make a lot of aldosterone. And that's usually due to, these are two relatively common causes. Okay, so either way, increase in renin, increase in angiotensin II, increase in your aldosterone production. Okay, so what I want you to remember here is that these are what's called secondary causes. And these are kind of a little bit more of those common ones that you guys want to remember. The last one, and I really don't want you guys to get too crazy on this one, get bogged down on it, but there's actually what's called a pseudo hyperaldosteronism. It seems like there's a similar issue where there's a lot of aldosterone, but actually it's an underlying issue related to something else. Let me explain what I mean. Sometimes if people have very high levels of cortisol, you know, there's a condition called Cushing syndrome. They have Cushing syndrome. Whenever there's high levels of cortisol, cortisol can act similar to aldosterone. And it can, other mechanisms as well. We're not gonna get too crazy into the, into the weeds here, but it can act similar to aldosterone and cause an increase in the pH by absorbing some bicarb and getting rid of protons in the urine. So Cushing syndrome can kind of look like aldosterone, but there's no increase in aldosterone. It's an increase in cortisol, and that increase in cortisol is kind of mimicking that effect. So that's the overall thing. And the last one here is if you could put someone on a drug that is like aldosterone, like fluid or cortisone. So that's a kind of a medication that you give to people whenever they're kind of hypotensive. But either way, these are the big, big ones that I really want you guys to remember. Primary, con, secondary, renal artery stenosis, CHF cirrhosis, and then pseudo hyperaldosteronism, Cushing syndrome. I think that's good enough. All right, the next saline resistant uh, kind of etiology, I don't want you guys to get bogged down in the details, but I want you to know the conditions and then how they kind of basically work. Um, these two are called barter syndrome, and the other one is called Gittleman um, syndrome. <laughs> you probably need to know this probably because someone's got a name on it, and that's why. But the basic thing I want you guys to remember is that barter syndrome acts as if someone's kind of like on a loop diuretic. So if you guys remember, loop diuretics do what? You get rid of a lot of sodium, you get rid of a lot of uh, potassium, you get rid of a lot of water, 
But what else do you get rid of a lot of? Protons. And a little bit of bicarb reabsorption. And either way, if you're getting rid of protons and you're reabsorbing bicarb, what's the overall effect? You're increasing pH. All I want you to know is that this is if someone's on a loop diuretic. So BL. Gittleman syndrome is if someone's on a thiazide diuretic, but the overall effect's the same. They get rid of sodium, they get rid of a little bit of potassium, they get rid of water, they get rid of protons, and they reabsorb a teensy bit of bicarb. And this is if someone was on a thiazide diuretic. Okay? That's really all I want you guys to know. The big takeaway is that BL, barter, acts like if someone's on a loop, GT, Gittleman acts like someone's on a thiazide diuretic. Either way, they can cause metabolic alkalosis. All right, so the next etiology here is that I want you guys to remember is hypokalemia. So hypokalemia, basically, there's just kind of this uh, like shifting uh, of potassium and, and usually protons. So what happens is, is whenever there a patient has hypokalemia, this can happen in the proximal convoluted tubule cells, this can happen in other cells in the body, but in the PCT particularly, when someone has hypokalemia, what happens is they spit a lot of these protons out into the urine from that shifting of these potassium proton exchanger, and then they bring in some of these potassium ions. And so in hypokalemia, it's people can get rid of a lot of protons in their urine. If you get rid of a lot of protons in their urine, what happens to the proton level in the blood? Well, the proton level in the blood is gonna decrease. And so because of that, if you decrease the amount of protons present within the blood, that's gonna cause the pH to kind of jack up there, right? So that's gonna cause a metabolic alkalosis. And this can happen kind of as other cells in the body where they're shifting of potassium and protons as well. So these are, that's the big one. The last one that I want you to remember, again, not a super common one, but again, to be thorough here, sometimes if someone is receiving some type of alkalytic material or alkalotic material exogenously, and one of the big ones that sometimes is given for multiple different reasons, especially if someone is in acidosis, they have kidney failure, a couple other reasons, high ICPs, you can give them what's called sodium bicarb. And if you give someone a lot of this sodium bicarb, what are you giving them? You're giving them bicarbonate. And if you give a lot of bicarbonate, what's that gonna do to the pH? It's gonna jack that pH up, right? And so sometimes whenever people are getting sodium bicarbonate infusions, like a lot of what's called exogenous alkali, that could also be a potential etiology here for someone developing um, a metabolic alkalosis. All right, so this covers our etiologies, our pathophysiologies. Now let's kind of do like a little diagnostic workup of metabolic alkalosis. All right, so metabolic alkalosis, it's, it's really a straightforward diagnosis. I mean, you can pretty much say, okay, let's say I, I order an ABG on a patient. I could, right? But what would make me want to order an ABG? Well, let's say that I, I got a BMP on somebody, a basic metabolic panel, right? And when I got their basic metabolic panel, it came back and I saw that their bicarb was abnormal, right? So you know when you get a BMP, it kind of should give you a couple different things, right? So it should give you someone's sodium, it should give you someone's potassium, it should give you their BUN, their blood urea nitrogen, their glucose, it should give you their creatinine, it should give you their uh, bicarb, and it should also give you their, um, their chloride levels, okay? So what I want to do is, is let's say that I look at this and I see that the bicarb is off a little bit, right? Maybe their bicarb is elevated, okay? If I see that their bicarb is elevated, that may make me say, okay, maybe there's something going on. Maybe they have an acid-base disorder. Let me get an ABG. All right, so we get the ABG. When we get the ABG, this is what we get back here, right? Our pH, we see it's going up, right? Why? Because it's greater than 7.45. Our, our PCO2 is what? Well, normally that's 35 to 45. That's within a normal range, right? So a normal range. Bicarb is what? Well, it's like 22 to 26. This is above 26. So that's high. That's going in a different direction. It's going way higher than it should be. And then oxygen is within its normal range, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So it's normal oxia. So if I see that the pH and the bicarb are moving in the same direction, what does that tell me then? That tells me that there's a primary metabolic alkalosis. So in this case here, I can already tell that this person has a primary metabolic alkalosis and I don't really see much of the respiratory compensation present here, because usually what would happen? Well, if the pH is going up, what would you want to do to your CO2? Well, you'd want your CO2 to do what? Well, you'd kind of want that to start kind of going up, right? Because you want that to compensate. You want there to be more CO2 to make the environment a little bit more acidic, but I don't really see much respiratory compensation here. Okay, 
So we went through that. We've gotten our BMP. We saw that there was kind of an abnormality within the bicarb. We got our ABG. It showed primary metabolic alkalosis, no true respiratory compensation. We're trying to figure out now, okay, what's the cause? This is where I go to that next thing, volume status. Are they saline responsive or saline unresponsive, or, you know, resistant in this case? So the saline responsive are going to be your more common causes. Remember I told you that. And what, do you, what can you do? It's a, something that's very, very simple. If someone's in the hospital or you're just asking them, Maybe you look at their eyes and O's. Their eyes and O's is their intake, their output. It gives you a good idea of their overall volume status in the hospital. Sometimes it's a simple thing as asking them as well. If I looked, let's say, on my chart and I saw, oh, geez, here's my output, and this brown is representing vomiting or gastric residual that they've been suctioning off of the patient. If that's the case and they're pulling off a lot of, there's a lot of vomit or there's a lot of NG tube uh, suction here that they're pulling off a ton of residual, Ooh, that could be explaining why there's more output than there is input, their volume status is down. That could be one of the etiologies there. The next thing is I could say, okay, what's their urine output looking like? Or I could ask them, how's your urine output? Have you been peeing a lot? I look here and I say, oh, dang, they're putting out a lot of urine. You're urinating all the time. If there's way more urine output than there is intake, that's definitely going to lead to a volume depletion. So there's an increase in the volume of urine, right? And what could that make me think? Are they on a diuretic? Or is there some other thing that's causing them to get rid of a lot of this urine? And that's something I got to think about. But one of the things I talked about with the etiologies is what? Diuretic use. So that could be one way I could look at this. And then here's your, kind of your example where it's relatively normal. Right? There's nothing abnormal there. Maybe they have that post-hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis and you just got to look. Do they have a history of COPD and are we putting them on a ventilator and correcting their CO2? So it could be something as simple as that. So volume status will help you a little bit. The next thing that also can help you a little bit with those saline responsive and resistant etiologies is to check a urine chloride. So I look at their volume status, their eyes and O's, or ask them the question simply, and then I check a urine chloride. The urine chloride is pretty good because if the urine chloride comes back, and let's say that it is less than 20, that is usually more indicative of a saline responsive etiology. If I check their urine chloride and their urine chloride is greater than 20, that usually is indicative of more of a saline resistant etiology, okay? So that's the other way I could go about doing this. I check their volume status, I check their urine chloride. And you can check volume status in a bunch of other ways, right? You could check their mucous membranes. You could check their skin turgor. You could do an ultrasound of their inferior vena cava. There's a lot of different ways of doing it, but you just want to know, are they having a decreased volume? What's their urine chloride? That'll help me to figure out their etiology. Because then once I do that and I say, their volume down, they have a urine chloride less than 20, I go in, I say, what's going on? Are they vomiting? Lots of suction. Or are they on a diuretic? or do we have them on a ventilator and they have chronic COPD? And I figure out their issue and I address that issue and treat it. The next one's a little bit more complicated and this is the less common causes I told you, right? The ones that it's not gonna be like, you find, you find an ABG and it cracks the case and you're like, oh, this person has a problem with their, their, you know, their aldosterone system. No, they're not gonna do that. It's not gonna bust open the case. Uh, maybe, who knows? But the whole thing is, let's say that you do this, you run through it, you get the ABG, you find a metabolic alkalosis, their volume status is relatively normal, their urine chloride is greater than 20, they don't have any of these problems here. Then what you do is, you check and say, okay, what's their blood pressure? I want to know that. So I check their blood pressure. If the blood pressure is high, they have high BP, Okay, high blood pressure. That's gonna make me kind of like a little interested, like mm, maybe they do have this like weird aldosterone problem because remember what aldosterone does. It increases sodium, water reabsorption, increases blood volume, increases your BP. So I may start being a little curious and saying, okay, let me look at other things. So it would make me, before I start going into the plasma aldosterone renin ratio here, <laughs> plasma renin aldosterone ratio, let's say that I did think that there was an aldosterone problem. What is something I, I told you I can get from the BMP and start having a little bit more suspicion. If I think that this is an aldosterone issue, what else does aldosterone do besides increase your sodium and your water reabsorption? One of the things I may say is they have high BP, their urine chloride is greater than 20, normal volume status, but they have high sodium in the blood. They have hypernatremia. What else does aldosterone do? It gets rid of potassium. So what would their potassium be on the BMP? It'd be low. So they may have a low potassium. 
and then also we would get their ABG showing metabolic alkalosis and their blood pressure is high. If I do that, so I have a high blood pressure, high serum sodium, low potassium, urine chloride greater than 20, I start thinking about potentially an issue with the aldosterone system. How do I go about this? It's very, very straightforward. Remember we said that there was a primary type, a secondary type, and then a pseudo type. And these are the only ones that I really wanted you to remember. Primary was Kahn syndrome. The problem was the uh, adrenal cortex was making a lot of aldosterone. So what would the aldosterone be? The aldosterone levels would be high. Now remember, when you have lots of aldosterone, you reabsorb lots of sodium, you reabsorb lots of water. So what happens to the blood volume? So now think about it like this. Think about your diagram here. You get a lot of sodium, you get a lot of water. What happens to the blood volume that you have now that would be going to the kidneys? Would it be a lot or would it be a little? We have a lot of more sodium and water, so your blood flow is going to increase. Does blood flow, increasing blood flow, does that stimulate renin release or inhibit renin release? It's not going to cause renin to be released because you have normal blood flow. So what will happen to the renin levels? They'll be normal or they'll be lower. So because of this, the renin levels, you won't be making a lot of renin, so we'll just say to make this easy, there'll be low renin levels. Straightforward, right? Secondary. What was the problems? It was a renal artery stenosis that was blocking the blood flow, or it was the, 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 the heart was failing, or the liver was failing, and you just didn't have enough circulating blood going to the kidney. Either way, there was decreased blood flow. If that's the case then, what did we say that did? A decreasing blood flow to the kidney did what? It caused renin release, right? So use your diagram here. It caused renin release. So there was a decrease in blood flow. That's going to lead to an increase in the renin production, okay? So renin production will increase. What does renin do? Activates angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 activates what? Aldosterone. So what will happen to the aldosterone levels? They'll go up. Right, so it'll signal your adrenal cortex and say, hey buddy, start popping out some aldosterone, and the aldosterone levels will go up. Difference in the ratio, okay? This last one though, it had nothing to do with the person having a problem with their aldosterone system, right? So it wasn't an issue with the aldosterone, it wasn't an issue with the renin, what was the problem that I told you the main one I wanted, really wanted you to remember? Cushing syndrome. So in Cushing syndrome, how do you work this one up? you order a what? A cortisol, right? You check their cortisol levels. So you check an AM cortisol level, and usually in this situation, what is it? It's high. And then you can also, to figure out where the cause of it is, is it pituitary, is it like a tumor in the lung, or is it an adrenal problem, you can also check out their ACTH levels to see if the ACTH is high, coming from the pituitary, if it's low, it's coming from the adrenal cortex, right? So that's the next thing you could do to isolate if it is a Cushing's. But I think this really gives you an idea of how to go about figuring out that, those rare causes. Okay? So that covers that and helps us to really understand these etiologies. Now let's talk about the treatments of these issues. All right, so let's talk about treatment. Treatment of metabolic alkalosis is relatively straightforward because, again, that's why this condition is, in a lot of the acid-base disorders, it's really primarily dependent upon what is the etiology, what's the pathophys, What's the cause? If you figure that out, you just treat the underlying cause. It's straightforward, right? If someone's vomiting a ton, what could I do? I can give them an anti-emetic, but I should try to figure out what's causing them to vomit. But if they're having a ton of vomiting and I want to treat that vomiting, I can give them an anti-emetic. Okay, to try to reduce the vomiting, that will reduce the amount of protons that they're getting rid of from their GI tract and help to prevent some of that, that alkalosis. The other thing I could do is that maybe we can't control that. Maybe it's the suctioning part, right? So you're having somebody who you're trying to, you're having to suction them a ton of, and you're pulling off a lot of their hydrochloric acid. It's simple. Decrease the NG tube suctioning frequency if possible, or the amounts that you're having to pull off. That may decrease some of the alkalosis. The last thing is, let's say that you can't really do, you know, these things aren't working. Uh, sometimes what you can do is you can actually decrease the amount of hydrochloric acid that you're actually producing. So if the person is vomiting or you are suctioning off a lot, at least you're not pulling off a ton of protons from their GI tract. So the last thing that you could do is you could actually give them a proton pump inhibitor to try to decrease the hydrochloric acid 
production in the stomach. And if you decrease the hydrochloric acid production in the stomach, even if they do vomit or they suction, you're not pulling off a lot of protons. So that's a simple way of going about that. So that's the, the saline responsive one, right? The next saline responsive one um, kind of comes down to this diuretic problem, right? We said if we have someone on a diuretic, they're on a loop, primarily loop, sometimes thiazide, you're pulling off a lot of volume. You're pulling off uh, protons. And because of that, you're causing this alkalosis. What could I do? Maybe if you do need to diurese them and you do need to pull off fluid because they have pulmonary edema for some reason, you just have to decrease the dose maybe a little bit. So the first thing you should try to do before discontinuing it is decrease the dose. Maybe that'll work. The next thing is, so decrease dose of, particularly we'll put loop diuretic, that's the more common one. The next one is you might just have to stop the actual diuretic, so stopping the loop diuretic because maybe it's just pulling off too much of those protons and you're just reabsorbing too much bicarb. Now here's the next thing. What if you have somebody that you, you have, to, you've diureced them, okay? You've dropped their volume down and you've caused this, al this alkalosis. What could I do to try to fix these situations here? Well, one thing I could honestly do is just give them fluid back. So I could actually give them fluid, just like in this situation, if someone's vomiting or they're having a lot of suctioning, I should give them fluid back. So that's one thing we could do here, but also with someone who's on a diuretic or they're losing a lot of fluid, give them sodium chloride back. How do I give them that? Well, I give them saline infusions. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just have to give them IV um, saline infusions, right? So I'll give them a couple boluses of fluids, particularly what? like your normal saline, right? So your 0.9% normal saline infusions. And by giving them back, what that's gonna do is it's gonna give them back volume. And also, uh, normal saline has a little bit of an acidotic property to it. So it actually may reverse a little bit of that alkalosis. Here's the problem though, and this is what I really, really want you guys to remember. If someone has, you've diuresed them for whatever reason, maybe you were diuresing them because they have pulmonary edema and their cause for the pulmonary edema was this, they had some type of cardiopulmonary disease of some kind, right? So maybe they had CHF, and that CHF was causing some of that fluid to back up into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. Or maybe they have underlying cirrhosis. Maybe they have some problems with their liver, so they have some underlying cirrhosis, and maybe because of that, they less common, but in cirrhosis, there's a decrease in the level of albumin Remember that albumin maintains oncotic pressure or osmotic pressure within the blood vessels. If there's less of that, more of that fluid is gonna leak into the interstitial spaces causing pulmonary edema. Either way, here's the problem. In these people, if you have to diurese them to pull off the fluid because it's causing their pulmonary edema, right? And then you have to give them fluid back. Maybe their volume, they're intravascularly depleted because they're third spacing a lot of that fluid. But you have to figure out a way to give them some type of volume. Um, what could I do? Well, I could do a couple things. One thing I could do is in these kinds of conditions. So if someone has CHF or they have cirrhosis and I diurese them, but I want to give them back fluid because they're intravascularly depleted, I don't want to give them a lot. I can do two things. One is I can give them small boluses of fluid, okay? So maybe 250 cc's to 500 cc's at a time, because I don't want to fluid overload them and cause pulmonary edema again. The other thing that's become a little bit more utilized in some way, shape, or form is actually giving them other types of diuretics. So potassium sparing diuretics. So potassium sparing diuretics have been seen to be somewhat beneficial um, like spironolactone. Spironolactone is one. And the other one that's also utilized because it doesn't pull off as much fluid um, is acetazolamide. So acetazolamide. And sometimes with the potassium sparing diuretics, they like to give this with potassium chloride as well. So like chloricon tablets and stuff like that. So again, what could you do if you need to kind of, they have a person who has metabolic alkalosis and you've given them diuretics for these conditions, they're volume depleted and you have to give them volume back, small boluses, potassium sparing diuretics and acetazolamide. The last really, really, I, it's re very weird, but sometimes, not joking, you can actually give people hydrochloric acid infusions. Um, and sometimes that may be somewhat beneficial.
So these are the kind of the big things that you can utilize in these scenarios, okay? A big thing though, if the diuretic is just either decreasing it, stopping it, and giving them some fluid back. If you can't give them the fluid back because they have an underlying condition, give them small boluses or try these methods. Let's talk about these last eti uh, treatments for these underlying etiologies. All right, so now let's talk about the treatments for issues with the aldosterone system, right? The saline resistant type. So with this one, the whole problem, regardless if it's a primary or secondary type of issue, is that there's a lot of aldosterone, right? And the causes um, of these are something that we need to know because if we know what it is, we can treat it. If it's a tumor, if it's a big old goombok there that's sitting there, what can we do with that? Well, just cut that sucker out, right? So what would that be called? You could either do a tumor resection, sometimes they may even just remove the entire, entire adrenal glands or doing like an adrenalectomy or some type of tumor resection. Sometimes you try medical management, um, so you're giving drugs that are gonna basically oppose aldosterone. And so what are drugs that oppose aldosterone are basically block its effect of the peripheral tissues. One is gonna be spironolactone. And the other one is eplerinone. Okay, these basically are blockers of aldosterone, so they're going to block the peripheral tissue effect of it. Okay, so now that we know that this could be for pr like particularly for primary hyperaldosteronism, what about for secondary hyperaldosteronism? So if someone has like a renal artery stenosis, or they have CHF, or they have some type of cirrhosis, or some kind of problem like that, you treat the underlying issue. If it's renal artery stenosis, what do you go? You go in there and you kind of angioplasty a balloon or put a stent into that renal artery to improve the perfusion to the kidney or treat the underlying CHF if they have a cardiac disorder, treat their cirrhosis, and that should improve their underlying secondary hyperaldosteronism. All right, the next one that I want you guys to know here is like, you know, not super, super important to remember, but just to be thorough here is Barter and Gittleman syndrome, right? Uh, these ones, uh, it's very, very interesting kind of the way that they work, um, how you treat them. It's very interesting. So Barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, either way, this one acts like there's like someone's taking a loop diuretic. This one's as someone's taking a thiazide diuretic. Either way though, what happens is they cause you to waste sodium in the urine. Low sodium is a stimulus for aldosterone production. Aldosterone is going to do what? Well, it's going to reabsorb more sodium, more water, and then you're going to excrete potassium and excrete protons and have a little bit of bicarb reabsorption. As a result of that, that's going to be kind of a secondary hyperaldosteronism in a way, right? So give them drugs that block aldosterone, like spironolactone or plerinone, right? So we can give them spironolactone or we can give them a plerinone to just basically oppose that secondary hyperaldosteronism. Now, the next thing here is that if someone has uh, high cortisol levels, we said that this could be like a pseudo hyperaldosteronism, right? So if someone has like a pseudo hyperaldosteronism, uh, that it's not actually a lot of aldosterone, it's what? We said it's Cushing syndrome related, right? Like cortisol, high levels of cortisol. Well, high levels of cortisol, this isn't meant to be an endocrinology lecture, but basically, where's the problem with that? It could be a problem with the pituitary gland, right? So the pituitary is making too much ACTH. Um, and if you're doing that, what is it gonna do? It's gonna cause the adrenal gland to make a lot of cortisol. Cortisol is gonna act like aldosterone and have that metabolic alkalosis effect. What do you do? You get rid of the pituitary gland, right? So you can do what's called a transphenoidal resection of the pituitary, um, particularly that adenoma that may be causing it. What if it's an adrenal problem? So if it's an adrenal problem, what do you do? You just, maybe you have to cut out that adrenal lesion. Maybe they have an adrenal tumor. So there could be some type of adrenal tumor resection. And then the last thing is that Sometimes this could even be related to what? Uh, sometimes it could be someone's taking a lot of uh, corticosteroids. If they're taking a lot of corticosteroids, you may just have to decrease the dose. So this could be what's called exogenous type of effect from taking tons and tons of exogenous corticosteroids, decrease the dose of their exogenous steroids. And the last thing is sometimes you can give medical therapy to basically block the effect of cortisol in the peripheral tissues. And this could be things like ketoconazole or another one which is called metiripone. And these basically just basically block the effect of cortisol in the peripheral tissues. Either way, you fix the underlying issue, that's gonna help to resolve the metabolic alkalosis. So this gives us everything that we need to know about metabolic alkalosis.
All right, engineers, so in this video, we talk about metabolic alkalosis. I hope it made sense, and I truly hope that you guys did enjoy it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time. Thank you.